I think what was amazing was we went six and a half thousand miles and you'd got this incredible geography with one of the deepest river gorges in the world and a mountain three miles high, spectacular looking landscape. And in it, you've got this beautiful old town, which is a, a classic part, I guess, of, of a disappearing China. You've got this culture, one of the oldest cultures in the country, and this amazing religion with all its drama and, and, and color. And all of that's at risk because China's modernizing. And I think the fact that the University of Northampton has chosen that as something to focus on and invited us to be a part of that is really, really exciting. And I think it's important that somebody, you know, moves to protect that culture. I think having the opportunity to work with the ITV crew and see their approach to com composition and how they're looking at the environment and what they were looking to get away was really influential to me and an amazing opportunity to learn from a, another area of media. Well, as a reporter, I don't often uh, get a chance to be, I suppose, embedded with the people I'm filming with. Um, but because it was an art trip, I found there was a lot of crossover between what I was looking to do and what they were looking to do. And to be able to film them and record their, their experience really was a real privilege. I was on the tube the other day and I saw this poster advertising the university and I just felt this little moment of pride and I thought that, that's my lot. In a remote corner of China lives one of the country's oldest peoples. The Nashi have long dominated this area, held together by a tradition and history enshrined in their unique language. It's the only picture language still in use today and lies at the heart of their colorful religion. It records the lives of the Nashi for hundreds of years and some experts believe it dates back to cave paintings found nearby. But Nashi culture is under threat as the modern world reaches Western China. It's brought a huge influx of tourists to their ancient city, and parts of their homeland have been flooded for a huge hydroelectric scheme. It's even feared the cave paintings could end up underwater. A team from the University of Northampton has arrived in Yunnan province to help make a record of the paintings and to work with the Chinese on ways to preserve the heritage of the Nashi people. Once dubbed the Forgotten Kingdom because of its remoteness, there are now other reasons why the ancient realm of the Nashi could soon be forgotten. In the far southwest of China, in the shadow of the poetically named Jade Dragon Snow Mountain, lies the ancient city of Lijiang. Close to the border with Tibet and Burma, it remained untouched by progress until the middle of the 20th century. It's about as far as you can get from the capital Beijing, and its sensitive borders have meant visitors have not always been encouraged. 
but the Chinese authorities have invited a delegation from the University of Northampton to cooperate on a very special project in this remote region. Getting into China and understanding such sensitive areas uh, is quite unique. And I feel quite privileged that the University of Northampton has been able to come to the region and explore parts of the country that probably most Westerners have never had access to. Senior members of the School of the Arts first came to Lijiang in 2011 to learn about a unique pictorial language still in use here. What they found out inspired them to return with a research team of art students. What we saw just blew us away. There's this mountain paradise sort of nestled in amongst this sort of uh, high peak and it, it's nurtured a really rich and varied culture and we were just fascinated by it. Within the School of the Arts we pride ourselves of putting students at the heart of everything we do. We've got a, a couple of photographers, a, a couple of artists, uh, a creative writer, a graphic designer and even one of our PhD students had uh, archaeological background. The Nashi people have been known about in the West since the 1920s, a hidden treasure in an unspoiled part of old China, home to a tribe whose colourful religion captured the imagination of explorers. The ancestors of the Nashi found a home here many centuries ago, bringing with them their dramatic Dungba religion, a cult dedicated to worshipping the nature that surrounds them. Its most potent symbol is their three and a half mile high mountain. The mountain is a god. They just pray for it. And there's a lot of mystery stories about it. Uh, first of all, you know, they're just they're saying, you know, no one really successfully climbed to the top because, you know, uh, the goddess has the power, not, the, uh, not other people, you know, to, to touch it. That tells us something that people really believe. Dongba is a prayer for nature. In other words, their god is the uh, whatever in the nature, mountain, tree. Uh, they're all uh, to be uh, the god and the goddesses, so they have a very good relationship with the nature. And that makes it significantly different from other uh, religions. In the countryside around Lijiang, religious ceremonies are practiced by Dongba priests using special scripts handed down through generations. The scripts contain pictorial instructions for the priest, who then adapts the ceremony to the needs of the family that's requested it. And quite often, those needs are very down to earth. Dungbar is very practical. After our prayers, we really hope the gods or goddesses will help the family to reach their goals. For example, if they want children or help making money or to be strong or beautiful. Dungba religion is at the heart of the Nashi people's culture and central to it is a unique language made up entirely of pictures, something like Egyptian hieroglyphics. But this is the only living picture language in the world. The first Westerner to study it was the American botanist Joseph Rock, who came to Lijiang in 1923 for a week or two to catalogue plant life. He stayed for more than 20 years. During that time, Rock made a comprehensive record of the pictographs, around 4,000 of them in total. Following in his footsteps, the team from Northampton meets modern-day experts on the pictographs to talk about the language and investigate its origins. Some believe the language was the sophisticated invention of the Nashi's rulers. Others say it was devised by ordinary peasants to describe their everyday lives. The Dongba scripts didn't come from theorists and scholars writing about Nashi people. They came from the peasants themselves and were all about their everyday lives. And from studying the language, we can see how those lives were lived. 
At the same time, they weren't satisfied only writing about agricultural labor, hunting and the like. They were also questioning how the universe was formed. That led to a greater understanding of nature, which is what makes Dongba quite different from other religions. The pictographs have been around for several centuries. No one knows exactly how long. But their origin may be much older than that. The art students arrive in Tiger Leaping Gorge, a spectacular river valley near Lijiang that plunges 11,000 feet to the Jinsha River. They're on a quest for any evidence that recently discovered cave paintings from Neolithic times are linked directly to the Dongba language. Prompted by local experts who say the way the animals are depicted, and even details like the eyes and legs, are almost identical. The man who discovered many of the caves 20 years ago, priest He Limin, is certain his ancestors would have come across them. The cave paintings are normally at a point where animals cross the gorge. The creators of the paintings hunted here, ate what they killed, and celebrated by making the paintings, which is a kind of very primitive religion. Then they moved on. Thousands of years later, when the Nashi people came down from the north, they found the animal herds in the same place because that is their migration path, and they would have come across the paintings which inspired the Dungbar pictographs. What we're looking to do is decode those images and see what they mean. This is an artistic tradition, actually, to look at the work of the masters and to reproduce those drawings so that you understand better the judgments that those artists made. Now, if we transpose that to the Neolithic paintings and, and think about the minds that produced that work, then you get a, a particular insight that you wouldn't get from a scientific or an anthropological perspective. The initial study of the cave paintings involves the students making a photographic record of the locations of the paintings and trying to redraw their intricate shapes. When you've got a groove, when you put the paint into the groove, it gets more intense. And there are a lot darker colours around here, actually, aren't there? There are, aren't there? With them is veteran landscape artist Robert Perry, who, although in China for the first time, is very much in his element. I've got quite a lot of experience of working on location. Um, you know, I've worked in the Alps, I've done a lot of work in historic sites, Auschwitz and the First World War battlefields, so I've got quite a good background of uh, how to approach that kind of subject matter. And in fact, I was asked um, really to look at the environment, to, to draw it, to paint it, record it, as I've done for many years, trying to get the, the spirit of the place where these people lived. All this may be a race against time. The rapid modernization of Yunnan province has brought with it a huge hydroelectric power scheme. Parts of the Nashi homeland have already been flooded, and there are fears that thousands of years of history could be lost. There is a pressure to make careful records of the caves and the culture. If modernization is threatening to destroy the Nashi's distant past, it also threatens their future. There are 140,000 of them living in Lijiang. Last year, they welcomed 12 million tourists. Most come from within China, drawn by the ancient city of Lijiang. It's a world heritage site, but most Nashi people have moved out to make way for guest houses and souvenir shops. The Nashi Orchestra, playing authentic Chinese temple music, used to pack the old town's theater. Today, only a handful of visitors come to hear them. But outside, the karaoke bars are rammed with partygoers. The dramatic costumes and language of the Dongba are on sale here too, but it has become a kind of theme park with pictographs as souvenirs. The sad part is that a lot of the pictographs are wrong. 
It's just not that easy for someone who isn't part of the Dungba religion to create them simply as a souvenir to sell to consumers. I think I was really struck by the fragility of the indigenous culture in the face of rampant globalization. It's just impossible to, to stop the, the rising tide of tourism. The old town, in, in my memory, it is a quiet place that everybody, everybody is living um, in harmony, but not in um, the, the disco dance music there in bars. I think sometimes we need to stop for a little while to think about who we are. It was an eye-opener, but in an amusing way. I really liked the way that everyone was kind of posing. It was like being on 25 simultaneous model shoots, watching the women really construct themselves, like out of fashion magazines. That was really interesting. Um, but I didn't think for a single second that that was a representation of the culture that we'd come out to see. The government now is really worried about this too. You know, they don't think that you know the commercialization of the ancient town is uh, sustainable. They're trying to, to find other ways to really explore the value of the culture. Government money has been provided to train new Dongba priests who will inherit the scripts and carry on the religious tradition. The other initiative to keep this visual language alive is through art. Artists from Lijiang's Nashi population are putting the pictographs to work in their paintings and carvings. They're being encouraged to give traditional Dungba symbols new life and a relevance to the modern world. Well, everything I have done has had the purpose of trying to preserve the Dungba pictograph. Trying to get all of Nashi society to resume the Dongba religion is very difficult, so it'll be hard to preserve it that way. But as an art form, it's a lot easier for people to understand. And by understanding it, they will also understand something of the Dongba religion. I think it's all about um, simplifying things down, like their lines, the lines that they make are so perfect in shape and width and size that um, if you can get it the same every time then it becomes a symbol that everybody recognises, which is something that in graphic design you've got to try and achieve. I want to reflect the modern life of the Dongba. I don't want to copy the ancient pictographs, I just want to make them better appreciated. For example, recently I made a series of carvings in which I used the pictograph symbol of water to represent the hair of the women in the pictures. This is like a Dongba symbol for water, uh, which is kind of, it's a visual symbol. Everybody can understand it. While in, in modern days we got letters, it's five characters and it's in English. Only people who speak English can understand it. But in, back in those days, everybody could understand this. What you get is a strong sense of how important the Dongba religion is to these artists. Um, so they're not there literally just as a motif to, I think, badge the work with some sort of authenticity. I think, it's cause, I think it's because there's a strong passion and a commitment to to that culture, to that heritage, um, and they're being really inventive, I think, in how they're how they're referencing the Dongba religion. For the students, this has been an amazing opportunity to study a culture on the other side of the world, and to put into action skills they've learned or developed at the School of the Arts. And it's been a pretty unforgettable trip too. Each one of them seems to have had a, a really fantastic experience and it will push their work forward in, in, in their own personal direction, so it's been lovely to, to see that. The thing that I've gained that I didn't come expecting to gain was a real engagement with the language. Um, 
I have a real struggle learning languages, but I've always been interested in them. And, and being the only pictorial language left in existence, I think that really engaged with me as a sort of visual person. And I've really enjoyed trying to sort of tell stories through that and uh, trying to translate my diary into Donga script. I think I've learned to respond to visual art and I've learned to incorporate travel writing. Um, that's something I've never practised because I've never been this far away from home. Um, that's definitely been an eye-opening experience for me. Working with Mr Yu on this piece, that was, that was really, really a nice experience and, and a lifetime memory. We indeed learn something from all the team teammates. Yeah. And we went a lot of places and visited some artists and making some new friends, yeah. which is very precious for us. I was really interested in the cave paintings, um, trying to, you know, look at pigment or see what they used, how they used, why. And what I think I'll draw from most is actually trying to capture the colourfulness of the place, the people, the stuff that happens spare of the minute that, that seemed to be the best. The University of Northampton has joined forces with the Chinese authorities to set up research centres in Britain and China. They're dedicated to preserving and promoting the Nashi culture, the Dongba religion, and the unique visual language at the heart of it all. It seems the sleeping dragon is waking up to the importance of safeguarding the unique traditions of this remote area of the country. The question is whether it has awoken in time.